Dr. Michael Brown, your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Michael Brown is the director of the Coalition of Conscience and president of Fire School of Ministry. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Well, I, I cannot believe I wrote this article five years ago. August 13th, 2016, wrote an article called A Rabbi Claims That God is Transgender. I I thought it was like a couple years ago, five years ago. And here we are, because I've been contacted by a pastor concerned with teaching that's been circulating in in some of, uh, among friends and colleagues that, that wants to point to the feminine aspects of God and even address God as mother. So since it's Thoroughly Jewish Thursday, so I was praying, thinking last night, which we wanted to go on the show today, I thought, well, let's dig into the Hebrew Scriptures, and let's examine, does God ascribe gender to God? Is that out of place to speak of God in those terms? Does it matter that he's spoken of as the father and not the mother in Scripture? This is just part of the worldly, contemporary, spirit-of-the-age mentality that wants to question many things we've taken for granted in Scripture for many years— So we're going to dig in to the Word, and as always on Thursday, we'll take your Jewish-related calls, 866-34-TRUTH. That's 866-348-7884. So by Jewish-related, it can be regarding the Hebrew Scriptures, it can be regarding the Hebrew language, regarding Judaism, regarding the state of Israel today, Messianic prophecy, Jewish background to the New Testament— All that would qualify. Now, last week, for some odd reason, we had more than any time in the history of the show got a bunch of prank calls, and a few of them directly related to to LGBT prankers or or pro-gay activists or whoever they were, and a a man who said he was a a rabbi who identified as as queer, etc. We spoke at some length. I didn't know if it was a prank call— or not, he said enough to, to make me think it could well have been a prank call, especially some people he mentioned at the end when we just checked on names. They're just bogus names that were mentioned as, you know, minister, rabbi that had certain positions. But I, I kept the conversation going because I've had enough discussions like this to know that he was representing positions that people do hold to. Uh, so well, that whole thing was just a complete prank. Either, either way, we had the discussion. Uh, because it did touch on relevant issues. <laughs> in any case, if you're calling to prank today, why not find something better to do? All right, but it, it was wild, just out of the blue last Thursday. 866 348 7884. In this article five years ago, I, I made these points. I, I said that if this rabbi, it was, it was um, uh, Rabbi Mark Samoth, who, who claimed that the Hebrew Bible when read in its original language offers a highly elastic view of gender and counter to everything we grew up believing, the God of Israel, the God of the three monotheistic Abrahamic religions to which fully half the people on the planet they belong, was understood by its early worshipers to be a dual gender deity. That's absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense to say it like that. Now, I made these points. Had the rabbi simply stated that God transcends gender, I would have no argument. Because gender is ultimately something earthly in terms of biological sex, male versus female. Does God, an infinite spirit, transcend gender? Of course, obviously. If he had only said that when God created human beings, he created them male and female, indicating that the fullness of the meaning of both male and female is to be found in God, I would have concurred. Amen to that. In other words, the full expression of God's nature is found in both men and women, created in his image and yet with distinctives, all right? So I agree with that. And if Rabbi Samoth had simply pointed out that there are aspects of motherly care attributed to God in the scriptures, like Isaiah 49, 15, which we'll look at in a moment, I would have also concurred. And in rabbinic Judaism, the Shekhinah, The manifest presence of God also emphasizes some of the motherly aspects of God. So no argument on any of those points. No argument at all. 
but Rabbi Samath was saying something much more than that. And those who are arguing for something much more than that today would actually want us to conceive of God as mother or heavenly mother, or even pray to God as mother, or refer to God as she as well as he. That we must firmly resist as unbiblical and heretical. Recognizing again that God transcends gender, recognizing that God created us male and female in his image, and recognizing, again, that there are motherly aspects of God in terms of his tenderness and his compassion and his empathy. We understand all that. Don't argue with any of that. But it's interesting that he reveals himself to us as the Father, the Father, the Father. Here, let me, let me just remind you of this and, and run through a few scriptures. Then we're going to dig into the, into the Hebrew Bible together. Uh, Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Jesus says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Matthew 24, 36, no one knows the day of his return, not the Son, only the Father. Matthew 28, 19, baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Uh, it just, it's on and on uh, through, the, through the New Testament. You know, think of something as simple as John 14, 6, right? What what does Jesus say there? He's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to what? The Father, except through him. Or how about a passage like John 5, 19? Jesus says, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only when he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does. For the Father loves the Son. As the Father raises the dead, the Father judges no one. The Son, he's given all judgment to the Son. Everyone should honor the Son as they honor the Father. And, and on and on. Why, why this revelation of God as Father? Why did Yeshua teach us to pray, Avinu, our, our Father in heaven? Why does he put the Spirit within us by which we cry out, Abba? Why don't we cry out, Ima, Mother? Why do we cry out, Abba, Father? What does is, what is Paul write in, 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 in 1 Corinthians, the eighth chapter? What does he say there? He says, the people in the world, they have many gods and many lords, yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus, the Messiah, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. There is something about God as Father that is important in our relationship, just as the role of the Father in the home and the role of the Father with children plays a certain role and the mother a certain role. It, it is the, the fatherlessness aspect of things has certain destructive effects in unique ways on children and the plagues that we have in our society. And, and, and here, the father is the source and the origin. And, and, and when we relate to him in this way, it is critical. It is essential. So what do we do with different passages in the Hebrew Bible that, that might emphasize other aspects of God's character? Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. So in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. There are different renderings of that, right? And then it, it goes through the earth unformed and void, darkness over the face of the deep. Now, the, the new JPS version says a wind from God sweeping over the water. But the, the better argument, I believe, is that where it says, Ruach Elohim, Ruach Elohim, Ruach Elohim, Ruach Elohim, Ruach Elohim, that that is the spirit of God. And if you know Hebrew grammar, you see it's Merachefet hovering, which is, which is feminine. So the Hebrew word for spirit or wind or breath is feminine. But here's what's important to understand. Is there something specifically feminine about breath? Something specifically feminine about wind? The answer is no. Uh, Just like everything in in certain languages, Spanish, Italian, if you're speaking that, has to have male or female, right? That, That everything has to have a gender so you can refer to it as male or female. So as I always mentioned right here, this desk, this shulchan, is, is male. And this chair, this kise, is, is male. Kise, throne, or throne in scripture, right? Uh, so so the, the, the point is that maleness and femaleness of, of things of that kind don't really tell us anything. But even if, even if you wanted to argue that the Spirit of God represents certain feminine aspects of God. Even if you wanted to argue that, which is not, not a scriptural argument. In other words, when you go through the Bible and look at Ruach, 
It does not have specific feminine connotations. And in the New Testament, it, it, can, be, it can be neuter in terms of gender. So it, it's not specifically feminine as it's being used in the New Testament. So that's, that's, that's another argument that pushes back. But the Spirit is poured out like water. There are different pictures and analogies that are used. So the bigger question is, okay, are there verses where God is called mother or where God is spoken of as the mother or the heavenly mother or we pray our mother anywhere in the Bible? No, zero, never, 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 not a single time, nothing close to it. So what kind of verses are, are raised to argue that, that we should relate to God as mother as well as relate to God as father? Well, one of the verses is Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 11 and 12. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 11 and 12. And it says, like an eagle who rouses his nestlings, gliding down to his young, so did he spread his wings and take him, bear him along on his pinions. The Lord alone did guide him, no alien God at his side. You say, well, hang on, it's masculine. Kinesher, that's that's like an eagle, masculine. Yahi arouses, that's that's a masculine noun. Kino, his nest or his nestlings, and it's ev- everything in it, even Yerachef is masculine, not Mirachef or 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 Tirachef here. All right, but Yerachef, masculine. So it <laughs> I mean, I was stunned. Someone sent me this verse the other day saying this is one of the verses that's being used. Just as mentions an eagle, it's, it's, it's talking about a male eagle here. In other words, people are stretching this far to try to come up with these nuances, whereas throughout Scripture, here, God has revealed that Moses sings the song, he's an ish milchama, he's a man of war. He's often spoken of as a man. Again, he trans- transcends gender, but he reveals himself to us in this way, and he reveals himself as he rather than she, and incarnates himself in this world as the son of God, as, as a man, not, not as a woman. All right, there, there are reasons for that. He's never, he's called a man of war, but he's never called directly a woman, ever. Not once in the Bible. In the, the multiplied thousands of references to God, not once. All right, we'll come back, look at more scripture, and take your calls. So what about the black Hebrew Israelites, or as they sometimes call themselves, the Hebrew Israelites? Are they a dangerous cult? Oh, yes, absolutely. You might have some who are very mild in their views, who simply believe that as blacks, that they are the original descendants of Israel, and they preach salvation through Jesus like anyone else. Okay, that's fine. But the ones that you find on the street corners, the ones that you find aggressively putting forth their message, they are full of hostility. They are full of hatred. They are bigoted. They are Jew haters. In other words, someone like me, they claim that we are the manifestation of Satan, that the white man is the manifestation of Satan. Many of them do not preach the Jesus of the scripture in any real respect. They preach a cult figure, Yeshua, or whatever name they give to him. And they would say that basically all blacks are the original descendants of Israel. So are there black Jews? Yes, absolutely. Like there are white Jews. Are there black Israelites? Yes, just like there are white Israelites. But are all blacks the descendants of the people of Israel? No, of course not. Categorically not. That is not so. That's part of their false teaching. Many of them are thoroughly legalistic in their teaching and then add in other customs. They are a cult. They are dangerous. They're spreading. Here's what Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. He had this concern. He said this, if someone comes and proclaims another Jesus than the one we proclaim, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or if you accept a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it readily enough. There is something happening now with the Hebrew Israelites, with the black Hebrew Israelites, especially in inner cities, especially in different uh, African-American communities in America, where they are gaining more and more following. But because they bring people into bondage, not freedom, because they practice hate and promote hate rather than love, because they preach another Jesus, when we bring the real message of truth and liberty and salvation through the Messiah, not through a white Jesus, but through the biblical Messiah, they'll find liberty. 
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get into the Line of Fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. What sacred words from Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, or the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. It is Thursday, Jewish Thursday. I'm going to be getting to your call shortly, 866-348-7884. Any Jewish-related question will be getting there shortly. Uh, I want to read something to you from this article that I wrote five years ago. And it's this, the name Yahweh, debate the pronunciation, but yud heh vav heh yhwh of the more than 6,000 times that the name Yahweh occurs in the Hebrew Bible, it never occurs with a feminine adjective or verbal form. The name is exclusively masculine. Even more importantly, this is the consistent revelation of God in the scriptures. He is the heavenly father, not the heavenly mother. Mother. He is a man of war, not a woman of war. He is the king, not the queen. He is the shepherd, not the shepherdess. He is the husband to the widow, not the wife of the widower. He is the Lord, not the lady, the master, not the mistress. He is the groom, while Israel is the bride. And on and on it goes in count, countless thousands of times. So friends, let's just step back and, and, and analyze and recognize this, this desire to see the feminine side of God or view God as heavenly mother is part of a cultural trend it is the sexual revolution just continuing to sweep into the church. It is nothing less than that. And I guarantee you, as surely as I'm sitting here and speaking to you, as surely as you're hearing my voice, I guarantee you that those that go in this direction and argue for this theology will increasingly depart from other fundamental aspects of the faith. And over a certain period of time, will begin to question the authority of Scripture or will begin to question male and female marriage being the only acceptable unions in God's sight, or we'll begin to question other doctrines or salvation exclusively through Jesus, Yeshua. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. And, and I can just say, watching this happen in the past, you know where this leads. Think of all the illustrations where, where God is the aggrieved husband and Israel is committing adultery with, with other, other men, right, as they worship, the people of Israel worship idols. These are always the images. This is how these are how things are, are related. All right, let, let's look at some other verses that, that are quoted. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 18. So we've seen the bogus reference to Deuteronomy 32, 11. Uh, what about this? You neglected the rock that begot you. So the Hebrew is yalad, which means to father or beget. Forgot the God who brought you forth. All right, now, does that mean to bring forth as in labor, like a woman in labor. Yeah, it, it could have that image, bringing forth painfully. It could simply mean to bring forth. But the key thing is, it, it, it is ale, it is God as masculine that does this. So he is, he is not, he is talking about bringing Israel forth, whatever process he did. E even if it's likened to a woman in childbirth, that God, the pain with which God brings Israel forth, the fact is it's a male deity. There were, there were plenty of female deities in the ancient world that were worshipped. Some of the most powerful deities in the ancient world, going to the New Testament, right, with, with Diana, worshipped by the Ephesians. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, but El Shaddai. Shaddai is the many-breasted God. Shaddai in Hebrew is breast, and God is the many-breasted God. Nonsense. The many-breasted deities were female. We have the iconography. We have the, the, the statues. We, we know what they look like, the, the women with, with multiple breasts. They were, they were female deities, and this was, this was part of their prolific fruitfulness and things like this and their abundance. This is how it was depicted. But, but that's common. You, you say, but don't scholars debate the meaning of Shaddai? Yes, but the, the top scholars almost all will virtually dismiss this many-breasted idea because it does not fit with a male deity. And, and, and Shaddai is always male. It could from, come from Shaddad, which has to do with being strong. It, it could relate uh, in terms of God coming in judgment. 
the, the biblical writers have a play on it. He showed me Shaddai Yavo. It will come as a destruction from Shaddai, but through Shaddai, the uh, Akkadian word for mountain, Shadu. So God is a rock, a mountain, powerful. Uh, some have broken up into Shaddai, that he is a, enough, the God that is more than enough. It's often how the rabbis took it. But, but no, there's not sc- active scholarly discussion that, yeah, this is very probably the many-breasted God. No, that applies to female deities. And there are many other explanations for, uh, for Shaddai. And you don't find ancient traditions in Judaism where they're taking it to be many-breasted deity. <clears throat> um, how about Isaiah 42, 14? What does that say? That God will cry out like a woman in labor. Sometimes the Israelites cry out. In times of judgment, they cry out like women in labor. I've kept silent far too long, kept still and restrained myself. Now I'll scream like a woman in labor. I will pant and I will gasp. That makes God into a mother? That makes God into female? That he's going to scream like a woman in labor? Raise his voice like a woman in labor? You've never heard of metaphors and analogies? If, if, if I said, yeah, the guy was in so much pain, he was screaming like a woman in labor. Did I just say he was a woman? No. What about Isaiah 49, 15? What do we make of that? Nothing to make of. God's care is even more tender and the care of a mother. Can a woman forget her baby or disown the child of her womb? You'd expect the answer would be no, but he says, no, she might forget, but I, I'll never forget you. I, I love you even more than a, a, a nursing mother. He's, he's not saying he's female. I, I mean, again, you think oh, you got the, the multiplied thousands of references to God in, in, in male context and male ways and referred to as he, and father, and all of this. And these lengthy passages where Israel is, is like a woman that he marries and loves and she departs and is with other lovers and on and on and on and on and on. There's abundant evidence from the beginning of the Bible right to the end. And then you have verses where God compares himself to this or God compares. Look, he's called a rock. Do, do we therefore conclude that, that, that God is not, does not relate to us because he's just a rock? Hmm. Uh, how about Isaiah 66, 13? These are just verses that people have put forward arguing for this mother God stuff. You think, if this is, this is their best ammunition, this is it's pretty bad. So what about Isaiah 66, 13? Uh, what does that say? Just waiting for that to come up on my screen, or I'll just grab it on my own screen here. Uh, Isaiah 66, 13. Every so often we'll have something freeze up. As a mother comforts her son... So I'll comfort you. You shall find comfort in Jerusalem. And that proves God is female. How about 1 Thessalonians 2, where Paul, speaking of himself and the other apostles, we were like like a nursing mother. Paul, speaking of himself, it says, yeah, we're not looking for praise from people, not from you or anyone else, even though as apostles of Christ, we could have asserted authority. Instead, we were like young children among you, just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we care for you. We said we we're like young children among you. We weren't looking for anything. We were just we weren't in this for ourselves. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we care for you. So does that mean that Paul, we should relate to Paul as a woman? Because he said, we care for you like a nursing mother? That God says, I'm going to comfort you like a mother? I, I, it boggles my mind that people think that these are actually arguments, especially with where they go with it. Uh, how about Hosea? One last one from the Hebrew Bible. Hosea chapter 11, beginning in verse 11. Uh, I fell in love with Israel when he was still a child, and I've called him my son ever since Egypt. We normally hear it translated, uh, when Israel was a child, Kina Yisrael, Vahovehu, and, and I loved him. Uh, thus were they called but they went their own way. They sacrificed to Baalim, to the Baals, and offer to carved images. And he says, I've, I've pampered Ephraim. I've, I've taken him by his arms. Um, but they didn't know that I was the one that, that healed him. So because it's talking about dealing with a baby, dealing with a little child, that makes God into a mother. I, I, you know, I, again, these verses were sent to me by someone to whom they were sent. And the one sending them was very serious. It made the claim there seven different times in the Bible, God's referred to his mother. 
No, God's never referred to his mother, ever in the Bible. Does he have motherly characteristics along with fatherly characteristics? Yes. Does he transcend gender? Yes. Does he care for his people more than a, a nursing mother cares for her child? Yes. Yes to all of that. Just as Paul cared like a nursing mother for the Thessalonians. But, okay, what about the New Testament where Jesus says in Matthew 23, how often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. That proves God is mother. <laughs> Jesus, speaking of himself, preexistent, how often he, he, Jesus, as the son of God, wanted to gather Israel's chicks together as a hen, like a hen, like, like, as, metaphor, analogy, like a hen, as a hen, gathers her chicks under her wings. So, uh, again, you've got, if, if we were just going to stack these up, we'd have a stack of verses so high that it would go from here up many, many floors. It's a one-story building. Well, got one extra little room up there, but if we had a 10-story building, if we had a, if, if we had a skyscraper, 100 stories, we, we'd keep piling the verses up with male references to God or God as Father or God depicted in male ways. And then a handful of times where he relates to his people like a mother. And again, reminds us that he transcends gender and that male and female are created in his image. But it is really important. It is really important we relate to him as Father, as the Heavenly Father. And that's why Yeshua directs us to pray to our Father in heaven. Everything flows from that. We'll be right back straight to your calls. You know, there are Jewish scholars who believe that Jesus was a good guy, that he was a rabbi, an orthodox rabbi, a fine Jewish teacher, and, and that he's not the one responsible for all the changes or founding, quote, Christianity. Rather, Paul changed things. You'll often hear that. There, there are liberal Christian scholars who believe the same thing, that, that Paul changed things, that he, he changed the gospel. Rabbi Shmuley in his book, Kosher Jesus, that I answered and rebutted in my book, The Real Kosher Jesus, he holds to this view as well, that Paul started this whole thing, that Paul's the one who taught uh, about vicarious suffering and Jesus dying as a substitute for our sins, and, and that Paul taught the deity of Jesus and introduced these new concepts. And, and some even look at verses, say like Romans chapter 2, verse 16, Romans 2.16 where Paul speaks of that day, on that day when, speaking of a final day of judgment, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of man by Messiah Jesus. So in other words, they're saying that Paul's saying God will judge man by my gospel. And that's because he preached this new message. Well, first, that's not how I read what he's saying. Rather, I understand what he's saying is just as I teach in my gospel, God's going to judge everyone at the end. He's not saying God's going to judge everyone based on my specific gospel message, but rather as I preach, when I preach the gospel, my gospel message that I preach, I tell you that God's going to bring judgment. But, but here's what we know. And I've laid this out in volume four of my series, Answering Jewish Objections to Jesus. And David Wenham has a couple of great books on it. All of the major themes of the gospel that Jesus taught, Paul taught. And Jesus said in Mark 10 that he would be a ransom for our souls and that the new covenant was made in his body and blood, which was broken for us and shed for us. And that he himself clearly identified as deity in a number of different passages in the gospels. And that he appeared to Saul of Tarsus as the risen Lord, that, that, that Saul refers to him as, as Lord and bows down before him. So there is nothing new that Paul is introducing. Rather, Paul had the revelation that one day Gentile and Jew would be one in the Messiah and that that time had already come. That's what he understood and that Gentiles did not need to become Jews in order to be saved. But all the fundamentals, I've laid it out, others have laid it out, all the fundamentals of the gospel, read in 1 Corinthians 15 where he lays them out. Those are the fundamentals taught by all the other apostles. Those are the fundamentals that we find in the gospels. And by the way, Paul couldn't just change everything without changing all of the early church, which was obviously not what happened. Rather, he was an esteemed fellow worker in the Lord. Yeah. 
It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, welcome to the Line of Fire. It is Thoroughly Jewish Thursday, 866-34-TRUTH. With your Thoroughly Jewish calls, this is not a, well, Mark Zuckerberg, Jewish, right? I can make, tie it in. Yeah, I just saw the headlines. Facebook is changing its name to Meta. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I mean, not that Facebook was some amazing name either, or Twitter is some amazing name. The things are what they are. But you think of all the money that must have gone in, into the decision. Facebook Inc. rebrands as Meta to stress Metaverse plan. Whatever the Metaverse plan is, is it tied in with the multiverse? No, probably not. Okay. 866-34-TRUTH. We go to George in Jacksonville, Florida. Thanks for calling the line of fire. Hey, Dr. Brown. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. Um, I'm reading a book called Fashioned to Rain. It was published in 2013. The author is Chris Bolaton. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but he puts forth a very interesting idea regarding uh, – how, and this kind of ties into your discussion about how we should refer to God, whether it's male or, or, or it's female. He describes in this book that when Adam was created, that he was intersex, that, that he was not just male, he was also male and female. And then later on, when God decides to create woman, he takes the feminine, not only the feminine uh, personality or characteristics of a female, but also the actual, you know, productive organs, et cetera, and create Eve. That kind of sounds bizarre to me, to be honest, and they, and I certainly don't want to misrepresent this guy's uh, point of view here, but in this context of what we're talking about here, he's kind of suggesting that God himself, like, and you've kind of said it, transcends gender, and but that it's kind of he is kind of pushing. I don't know. I'm, I'm really trying to wrap my head around. Yeah. So, uh, so the first, I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. The uh, Chris is actually a, a friend. Uh, you know, we're we're in touch every so often, but but he's a friend and colleague. Uh, we've never discussed this issue, and I'm quite confident that he would agree with every point I've made today, and would resist any idea of referring to God as she or God as mother anything like that. We, we, we refer to God as our heavenly mother, etc. cetera. Uh, and, you know, and interestingly, as Roman Catholicism developed, then you have the whole exaltation of Mary and that motherly aspect there, but there's no confusing Mary with the father in that regard. I'm not Catholic, but the point is, if there was the female in God, then you wouldn't have needed the Mary in, in terms of how things developed in Catholicism. But there is, there are some ancient Jewish traditions, not biblical, many, many centuries after Genesis that would think of, of Adam as androgynous uh, or even picture Adam as, as, as like back to back, like Siamese twin kind of thing, male and female, and then God separates, you know, those, those types of ideas. And you'd say in Genesis one, God tells Adam. So Adam is, is masculine and, and is man or mankind as well as the, the personal name, Adam that God says to Adam, be fruitful and multiply, right? So that is already presupposing male and female separated. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, don't, I don't see it like that where it says that God takes his, his side uh, I don't, I, and then closes up the flesh. I don't see that as saying that it's like back-to-back -back Siamese twins. So I, I would not read it like that at all. And I've always just dismissed that as rabbinic speculation because there's a ton of rabbinic speculation on all kinds of things. You have to sift through, sift through hundreds and thousands of, of ideas. Um, but there are some, I mean, Chris is not alone in saying that there, there, there are plenty of others who have had that idea. Uh, and then God differentiates uh, between, between the male and the female. Uh, but always from the beginning of God being identified as Elohim and, and, and then Yahweh being used in a masculine way, uh, all of the times he's revealed and spoken to, it's it's always one thing. It's it's there's there's never the she part, the mother part, 
in addressing God or viewing God. So even if there was some truth to that, certainly within Adam, there were qualities of male and female on some level, right? Uh, be, right. Because it says she's called Isha, woman, because she's taken out of the Ish, man. So that's true. And it's bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. This is why male and female can become one in a way that male and male can't and female and male, excuse me, male and male can't and female and female can't because that's same plus same. This is out of the one, the differentiation now comes back together. So that's what makes the union between male and female unique. Um, so there, there is something of the female that was in Adam when first created. I just don't see it in the physical way as, as was explained in this book. But certainly something of the can female I, nature. I, Go ahead. Can I make a uh, just thanks for you make me feel a lot better about reading this book, by the way. But just one last comment, and, and it's off topic, and so forgive me for this. But I've been re, I've been watching the Brownsville revival sermon from uh, Father's Day, nineteen ninety five, mm -hmm. and Doctor Brown. I, I of course as Eve is talking. Um, he's talking about how God's been moving on him previous to getting there. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking how prophetic everything he's saying of knowing what came after that. It, it just really it chills down my spine, mm. just watching it and how, how, and just I want to ask you this one last thing. He, there are several sermons in there that you can find on the internet, and you, you know, you probably were there, you saw this. But the style of preaching he uses, I don't know, Dr. Brown, if we're talking about for revival in America, whether the church, the churches, and I'm making a very broad statement, the churches here in the United States would accept that kind of preaching today because by today's standards, he's, he's considered negative. He's considered uh, um, narrow minded, you know, all, all across the yeah. gamut. And unfortunately, I've been to a church where they actually back up from talking about hell because it's negative. Yeah. And they don't want to bring people down, quote unquote. Yeah. So, so here's, here's the deal, George, uh, a few observations. Uh, number one, Steve had been talking to me months before Brownsville and we'd known each other a few years at that point by phone and by book and things. And he was always passionate, earnestly seeking God, always going for the lost. But he told me that God had touched him afresh and he was seeing God move in amazing ways. And so he was even more excited than normal. That was prior to Brownsville. What's interesting, though, is God only called me to be part of the revival 11 months into it. And then I was there for serving for, for four years. And I had only known the building you know, packed and the people running to the altar and the massive response and repentance and weeping every night and so on. And I was bringing back videos for Nancy to watch. And I was in my study working on something one day and I heard her laughing. And I said, what are you laughing at? I came in, she goes, I can't believe the first message. It seemed like nothing. It, 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 in other words, it was prophetic it, because it's like, huh, this is it. This is the beginning. Uh, but God was moving and the spirit was poured out. What's interesting is that, that Steve preached uncompromisingly against sin very loud, clear messages. I think there are hundreds online, and then there were books of his sermons that were, that were printed uh, and warned about hell, warned about judgment, did it with tears. And, and lost sinners knew that he loved them. But what happened was when they, when they came running to the altar to flee from judgment and to run to the cross, they received supernatural forgiveness. And instead of leaving hopeless, they left regenerated full of life, full of joy, and, and tears of joy when they, we'd hear their baptismal testimonies weeks or months later, and they talk about the transformation of their lives. It was glorious. So the key thing is to connect people with God. So he would always give the promise, but preach in a scriptural way, warning about sin. There are many churches in America that would welcome a strong gospel message, and the pastors and leaders bring it, but these were evangelistic sermons to reach the lost and the backslidden every night. So you could not have a steady diet of that just for your home congregation. In other words, that was not the Sunday morning diet for the people where that was their church home. That, that was the reaching out to a lost and dying world and to the backslider and to the compromised church. 
And that was super important to do that. If, if Steve was pastoring, then it would come out in a different way on, on Sundays because you're nurturing the flock, et cetera. But you're right. Many would not hear uh, what, what, what Second Timothy 4 talks about people with, with itching ears. They just want people that'll, that, that'll tickle their ears. That's always been an issue from the Old Testament until now. And it often comes up, but it's come up a lot more because we have a man-centered, me-centered gospel. It starts with me. If I've said over and again, the American gospel is this is who I am. This is how I feel. And God is here to please me. The biblical gospel is this is who God is. This is how he feels. And we are here to please him. We used to preach that we're wretched sinners and God's grace is amazing. Now we tell sinners, you're just amazing. You're incredible. You're wonderful. God, God would love to get to know you. But what do you need to be saved for? Well, I'll give him some time. I'll get, I'll, I know I'm amazing. I'll get to know God when I have some time. So, yeah, it's a very different message. But there is hunger. There is thirst. And, and, and there is a rising cry for the return uh, to a, a biblically-based gospel. My book, Revival or We Die, my new book, does have chapters that deal with that very subject. Hey, thank you for the call. 866-34-TRUTH. Let's go to Ben in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Hey, thanks for having me, Doc. Appreciate you, it. You bet. Um, so uh, I follow the ministry quite a bit, and my question for you on Jewish Thursday is, um, what is, so I follow Christian rap, and there's kind of a growing movement of uh, the Hebrew Israelite uh, movement. It's kind of gained a lot of steam, and um, I think it has some relevance because of, well, Israel's prophetic purpose and un- unnecessary race tension. So. I think my question is, what is the clearest way to deal with the idea um, that, or, or, or should we even deal with the idea, that idea? Should we ignore it, or, or what's the clearest way to deal with it when we come across it? Right. So th- there are there are voices that have been addressing this. Um, you know, you may have seen some of the videos of Vocab Malone. Uh, I have I have a friend who's really scholarly in these areas, a a, a black Jewish friend, a messianic. And I plan to do an extended dialogue with him to really flesh this out a lot more. But the short answer is, as much as possible, don't debate the side issue, but preach Jesus Yeshua and talk about freedom, forgiveness of sin, new life in him, rather than debate you're an Israelite or you're not an Israelite, etc. or Jews, the manifestation of white Jews, the manifestation of Satan. So stay right there. I'll finish on the other side of the break. What exactly is dominion theology? Well, it's understood in a couple of different ways. And in the first way, I categorically reject it. The second way, I differ with it. In Genesis chapter 1, God gives this commission at creation. God blessed Adam, speaking of Adam, representing Adam and Eve. God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And it is believed that this commission now makes its way into the New Testament with the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples of the nations, and that it is the role of the church to take over, that it is the role of the church to take dominion over society, over government, over media, over entertainment, over education. It is the role of the church to take over. I reject that. I reject that theology. I do not find that in harmony with the preaching of the Bible or the teaching of the New Testament specifically. I reject dominion theology in that regard. I believe that we have spiritual dominion in Jesus over demonic powers. I believe in Jesus we have spiritual dominion over sin in our lives. But no, we do not take over the world. We usher in the return of Jesus through the preaching of the gospel, and he sets up his kingdom and rules and reigns. Now, there are others who are post-millennial, who have a different view, that they believe through the preaching of the gospel over a period of time that the world will then submit itself to the will of God and the whole world will become Christian. And then after that, Jesus returns. People like Jonathan Edwards and Charles Finney held to post-millennial theology. Jesus comes after the millennium. I don't hold to that view personally, but I would separate that from the dominionist aspect of we're going to take over. I find that type of teaching and emphasis dangerous and something to be avoided and contrary to the spirit of the New Testament. 
author, international speaker, and theologian, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice of moral, cultural, and spiritual revolution. Get into the line of fire now by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Oh, yeah. Isaiah 12. You will draw water with joy in the wells of salvation. I love it. Thoroughly Jewish Thursday. Welcome to the broadcast. This is Michael Brown. So, Ben, on a couple of occasions, one time many years ago in New York City, somewhere in the early 90s, and then, oh, a couple of years ago, maybe, maybe um, in Charlotte a year or two ago, I had confrontations with black Hebrew Israelites on the streets and, you know, went up and engaged them, felt I was to do that, and tried to expose their ugliness, their hatred, their misinterpretation of scripture. But I also did it as a witness to others that were were watching. But in terms of actually bearing fruit with the people with whom I was speaking, uh, I I don't know that it did any such thing. I, I just did it in obedience to the Lord or just almost something I couldn't resist doing, but, but really felt, especially in New York, that I was, I was to do what I did. Um, the biggest thing to me is to contrast their hatred with our love, their message of legalism and anger with the free message of forgiveness through the cross. And that's, that's what I sought to do. Um, are there, there uh, uh, African-Americans who can trace themselves back to Africa and an Israelite or Jewish expression there that slaves coming over secretly practice these things? Certainly, yes. Uh, Do some date back to scattered tribes of Israel then going into Africa, then intermarrying? As you have, say, the Lemba tribe in, in, uh, in, in Africa, some other tribes with DNA testing have indicated, yes, that they would have Israelite roots. Yes, those things do exist. The idea that that uh, white Jews are not Jews is nonsense. The idea that every black person is originally Israelite, nonsense. Uh, but for most, the, it's best to really get to the gospel issues and say, hey, let's not even discuss that. Let's talk about who Jesus is, who Yeshua is, and and what the gospel is, and what it means to be saved, and how you receive forgiveness of sins. That That's where I would put my emphasis, okay? Okay, I appreciate the response. And um, like I said, the, it is kind of a growing movement. So um, one of the reasons I had that question is because, like you said, the, the onlookers are kind of keeping their eyes peeled and they're watching some of these guys that were seem grounded in the faith kind of slip into this this new thing. So yeah. Uh, so the the good I side of I that, know. the good side of it is that this was a, a growing, rapidly growing movement in inner cities of America, but completely under the radar of most national apologists. You know, Dr. James White took on a Black Hebrew Israelite a couple of years ago, and that resulted in, in many leaving that that cult and, and coming to the truth. You know, we heard good reports of, about that as things were exposed and others getting more involved. But it was something that was just, it was kind of off the radar. It wasn't on the internet so much. So now that it's getting more attention, now it can be addressed more because it's very easy to demolish the lies behind it. So the negative is it's spreading more. The good news is that, that there are more people aware of it and addressing these errors aggressively. And behind a lot of it is ultimately going to be an anti-Jewish spirit, that, that there's an anti-Semitism and wanting to deny the Jewishness of Jews. That, that's always going to be part of it. All right. Hey, question for you. Try to remind myself to ask you every day, have you visited vitaminmission.com and taken advantage of the special Dr. Brown offer when you plug in our special code with Dr. Mark Stengler's health supplements, you get a special discount and then a donation made to our ministry with every order. Uh, I, I have been so blessed. I'm so grateful to the Lord that he got hold of me seven and a quarter years ago and delivered me from all the unhealthy things I'd eaten virtually all my life and just helped me to enjoy eating healthily every single day. And, and I, I do it with joy, not feeling deprived, but with joy. But the health benefits, the energy, the vitality, the, the life. And then 
the supplements that I take, uh, Immune Wellness and Joint Plus, these different ones that have been so helpful, um, it, it, I, it blesses me to be able to share them with you and to know we can give you a discount and to know that, that our ministry is then blessed to, to, to get on more stations and to reach more people. So uh, take advantage of this. Share it with your family, friends. You'll find the supplements are second to none. And I, I really want to see you healthy as much as possible, spiritually, physically. So vitaminmission.com. That's the place to go. All right, let's go over to Spencer in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Welcome to the Line of Fire. Thank you. How are you doing today, Dr. Brown? Doing just fine. Thanks. Great. Um, so I have a question. I um, Well, first I have a statement. I came from the, um, the out of the Jehovah's Witness mm. background years ago. Okay, great. And I still um, am conversation quite often with, with a few of the the Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, over, a little while ago, I actually started studying just basic Hebrew with from a teacher. Mm -hmm. And I, when we've discussed uh, things related to the Trinity, I have noticed a few things that I think it was off the top of my head it's in Genesis 3, 8, where when I was looking into um, the wording, the words that were used, some of the Hebrew key words regarding Elohim, um, or, or sorry, Adam hearing the sound of Elohim in the garden. Mm -hmm. It wasn't written saying that it was Elohim walking in the garden, but I've read two different versions of it where the word is um, call or call, um, Kulf, and then Lamed, lacking the vowel point, and then another uh, version I saw, Devar, or word, that it was the sound or word of Elohim walking with Adam in the garden. Mm -hmm. And then I also was wondering if, that's a if that, in a sense, is a parallel to the Logos in John 1.1, 1, 1, where Yeshua uh, became flesh, the word became flesh, and then mm -hmm. tabernacled with us. Yeah. What is your opinion on that? Uh, on a certain level, I, I would agree, but uh, let me just correct one thing. So it, it does mention sure. kol, which is, is voice or sound. It, it doesn't say davar. Mm -hmm. Davar is not used there. Okay. For, uh, so, the, so Adam hears the sound uh, of, of the Lord walking in the garden. So kol can mean voice or can simply mean sound. Uh, mm -hmm. So it would suggest that God literally, in visible form, wa walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. Okay. Uh, it, mm -hmm. would, it would imply that. Now, you can't be dogmatic about that. We know elsewhere right. in the Hebrew Bible, God does appear in literal human form, like in Genesis 18, sure. for example. Yeah. Um, so yeah. the point would be that we know that elsewhere, John 1, 18, no one has seen God at any time. Right. Mm -hmm. Or First Timothy six, the same thing, that he dwells in unapproachable light. No one has seen him or can see mm -hmm. him. John five, Jesus says you've never seen him. So the right. question is, who was seen? And the answer is it's the mm -hmm. son who makes him known. So the, the sure. father, the creator and source of all things, remains hidden in his glory. And as the son is mm -hmm. the one who makes him known. So when the Hebrew Bible speaks of seeing God. It would be the son that they've seen. Just like in the New Testament, Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the father, right? Seen, yeah, sure. Right. So yep. in, in that sense, uh, is it like uh, a, a, a pre-incarnate example of the logos of God revealing himself mm -hmm. in this way? Uh, the answer could be very well could be true. The only issue, the only caveat mm -hmm. is that uh, God uh, creates, creates Adam and Eve. Right. So in yep. before the fall, you would have assumed that they could be in the presence of God and see his glory and they wouldn't die because of their perfection. But then after the fall, they wouldn't. The fact is, God is appearing to them after the fall. So that would suggest mm -hmm. that that the direction that you're going there is is correct. You know, you know, one of the okay. saddest things, though, 
about the Jehovah's Witnesses, aside from the quota sure. and the work orientation and the, the peer yeah. pressure with fear, but the translation oh, yeah. of the Bible is lousy. It's, it's just, awful. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's not just bad Hebrew, bad Greek, but it, it doesn't have life to it. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't. No. Uh, it, uh, years ago, two guys knocked on my, my door uh, where I was living in Jehovah's Witnesses. And the one guy was in training with the older one. And, you know, they're here to talk to me. So I just talked about the relationship I had with God and forgiveness of sins and intimacy with God sure. and the beauty of knowing him and being with him forever. It's just kind of with mm -hmm. as full of the life that was inside of me poured it out to them. And then I said, so what yeah. are you offering me that I don't have? And they've just been trained. And the trainee said, well, the hope, you know, hope for the future. I mean, it was so, I felt so bad for them because there they are. You know, sometimes it's yeah. a hot day and you're, you're out there and just going through it. May, may God open the hearts of Jehovah's Witnesses around the world. Uh, some are just raised in it, don't know better, but some so sincere and trying to do the right thing. May God give them an encounter with truth. May their hearts and minds be open. May they really come to know God. Hey, Spencer, blessings on you. May the Lord use your testimony to touch others. Hey, friends, be sure to visit our website. Check out my latest articles and videos. Be sure to sign up for our emails. You don't want to miss out on what we're sending out. That's Ask Dr. Brown, A-S-K-D-R-Brown.org. God bless.